Hello friends and welcome back for another episode of Indie Impressions. My name is Nick and today we're going to be checking out an early alpha version of a game called Glitch Space by developer Space Budgie. Uh, this is essentially a first person programming game. I know that's sort of a weird thing to frame it as, but what we're going to be doing is using a very creative visual programming interface to actually manipulate from a first person perspective the environment around us to get us from point A to point B. Uh, so it's going to be a rather interesting little ride. I played through this uh, just to make sure I knew what I was getting myself into, and thankfully the beginning uh, of what is shown in this version is actually not particularly complicated or anything, so hopefully you guys should be able to grab it just as quickly as I did, and uh, hopefully I'll make uh, some kind of obvious mistake, and then you'll probably pick up on it before I even figure it out. That's just sort of how these episodes go. So I'm very eager to show this one off. It's a very creative idea and something that uh, I think is absolutely uh, something I'm going to be completely engrossed in when this finally gets finished. Uh, it's a game that right now you can grab a pre-purchase on, you can grab, uh, you know, a vote if you'd like on their green light campaign and all that. So let's let's get right into it and then you can see what it is that you might be potentially interested in voting on in the first place. So it is a Unity game, by the way, in case anyone was wondering right off the bat. We are presented with a large open plane of blue and uh, a nice white ground here. I should mention also before we get too far into it, there is the potential for some slight... Uh, maybe seizure-inducing, epilepsy warning, triggering, uh, flashing lights and stuff. It's not necessarily a part of the game, but there are moments where if I'm framing the shot in the wrong way, well, as you can see, the screen up ahead of us, uh, that kind of thing happens, and sometimes it flashes more than other times. So we're going to walk through this little plane of crack in reality, I suppose. I'm not really sure what to call it, but we're going to walk through it, and it's going to take us to another area where we can then be told to use a uh, spacebar to jump pretty simple stuff. And the presentation strikes me as like a little bit of Mirror's Edge combined with like a little bit of Antechamber, and both of which are games that I absolutely love, so it's pretty fantastic to see such a uh, the bold, simple visual aesthetic that also is just quite elegant in its presentation. I think that goes hand in hand as well with the, uh, the audio design, which seems to be very lovely as well. Uh, and I just randomly fell off the top of that. That wasn't actually what I was designed to do. So let's try that again and not fall off this time. Uh, you can see the shadows all dynamically changing on the, uh, the gun or whatever this object is supposed to be. I'm not actually sure what this is, uh, but it is sort of the thing that gives us a focal point towards uh, how we're going to be interacting with the world around us. So let's walk through this and we can get to the actual editing and I will explain what exactly uh, we're going to be doing for the majority of this game. It is, at a core level, kind of just a puzzle game, but the presentation actually encourages some creative puzzle solving in a way that I'm not really sure I've seen any other game really do it. Uh, so we're going to right-click, and that's going to open up this interface, and you can see this interface actually will just spawn into the world. I'm not sure if this is like a bug or just the way that the game is designed, uh, but this is going to sit there on that little plane for a bit and then vanish. So let's uh, open this one more time and actually do some editing. So you'll see that there are two uh, vertices or lines that are going to terminate in this uh, visual programming square, this sort of like flowchart style box here. And these are your inputs, and then we've got an output over here. So uh, basically what we need to do is click on object, we're going to trigger main object, which is the object that's in front of us, this red cube that seems to be sort of glitching out right here. And now this cube is our main object, we can trigger that by grabbing this tether and dragging it over uh, into this input here. So we've got the out into the in, and then just the act of changing that scales the object down, and we're actually able to flatten it and walk across. So now we actually can leave this and get to the, uh, the area that is going to lead us to possibly, well, I don't know if this is necessarily a hub world, but it's uh, an area where we're going to be able to get to some more stuff. I guess it's kind of a hub world. You can see level 2 over there, maybe level 3 even beyond that kind of seems that way. Sort of like we're in a, a cyberspace golf mini golf course, but only with uh, a visual programming language instead of a golf uh, ball and clubs. Very strange metaphor, I know, but let's uh, jump into level one here and we'll do a little bit more exploration. This is a bit of a larger world here, and uh, a lovely cluster, uh, just from an art presentation style, uh, it's a lovely cluster of colors and shades uh, that sort of looks a little bit like a Kandinsky or some sort of uh, Mondrian style mosaics kind of art, very uh, constructivist feeling to it. I'm not sure everything I just said made 100% sense, but hopefully you're with me in spirit. So let's, uh, let's do a little bit more editing here and see if maybe we can add a little bit more to the visual programming interface here. It looks a little bit overwhelming maybe at first, 
Uh, but the only thing you really need to key into here is what do we have on the right, which is a numbers option, and what do we have as far as inputs, and that's this vector right here with one that's, uh, you know, rendered in red so we can kind of grab right away that that's a thing we might want to interact with. Uh, these are all locked down, by the way, you can tell this little lock in each corner means we can't drag these around and we actually can't really do much to interact with them other than plug things into the inputs. Uh, so what we're going to try here is, well, so we don't get things too complicated, we're just going to spawn a 10, and then we're going to drag this one into that one, and all of a sudden, this uh, has gotten to be much, much longer. So we're actually able to traverse this gap now, uh, because we've expanded the length of that object. So now we're going to right-click on this one, see if maybe we can do a similar thing here. Uh, you'll see these are all locked. I was kind of wondering what... And maybe, you know, give us a little bit of latitude to maybe mess around with these and see if we can create our own solutions, but I think it would be very uh, easy for someone to start deleting a bunch of stuff all of a sudden and realize that they've kind of broken the system. Uh, I'm not sure this is necessarily the best tutorial that could ever be, but it's also not that bad either. I mean, this isn't that difficult to wrap your mind around once you get some of the very basic concepts that we're dealing with here. And in this case, I think all we're doing is just modifying X, Y, and Z uh, axes by plugging things into this plug, that plug, or that plug. And you can see it actually does change X, Y, and Z there as we move across them. Um, at first, I was trying to actually edit those boxes, but that is not the correct way to do things. And I believe you can actually edit things while you're standing on them as well, which is kind of cool. Uh, so you can actually maybe create some sort of dynamic movement by doing things like that. Alright, so we're going to plug in another 10, because why not? Might as well go big or go home here. So we'll plug that into uh, the B. Is that is that what I want to do? No, this isn't actually what I want to do. What other options do we have here? Um, let's see. The other thing you can do is, I think this actually might work some of the time. You can actually drag things around. And in this case, maybe do I want to make this from 5 down to 0? Is that my problem? Not entirely getting the uh, the issue that I'm having. You know what? I probably don't even need to edit this. I think I actually could probably just jump over to it. <laughs> so never mind. We don't actually need to do a single thing there. Uh, that may not necessarily have been the proper solution, but the nice thing I like about this is you can actually come up with some of your own solutions. And I think later on that's going to be uh, one of the basic, most fundamental parts of how this game works is you'll be able to... Uh, take a task any way you can see a solution to it and start modifying things to your heart's content All right, so that platform seems to have gone transparent for some reason So maybe the collision on it might have turned off uh, Dynamically to put us in this predicament where all of a sudden we're gonna have to find our way out of this pit So what do we have to work with here our scalar multiply? Uh, seems to be the one variable and that applies to apply force on players. So this 10 triggers into multiply, that then terminates in scalar multiply. For some reason that seems to not turn into anything. So we're just gonna take a... Oh, you know, probably because it doesn't have a direction to apply force to. So now that we've got a hundred operating on that axis, you'll see we'll start to bounce around. So now we've actually multiplied and gotten out of that problem. Our, our character is this kind of hilarious little, probably like default uh, unity looking box man or something like that. So let's jump over here and it looks like this might be a goal up on the top there so you know, see how far we've come. There's actually a bunch more up there too so maybe we'll actually get to wander around some more. So what can I mess with here? Can we, we've got a maths option, can spawn a multiplier and maybe we want to recreate the same sort of scenario that we just had a moment ago uh, by using some numbers like a 10 force. So we can link that to that Link that to that. Like I said, you could just drag things over them like that, and they'll actually make the connections automatically. And see what this does. Oh, didn't really do much. So let's try something else then. Um, maths. Well, multiply is really all we get here. Oh, I can multiply this again? I guess you could create an infinite chain here, couldn't you? Um, by the way, I should qualify. I'm not a programmer. I don't know a ton about programming. Uh, but I do have some reasonably deep experience in some ways with modding and things. Okay, so I actually needed to trigger both of those inputs before it would actually pass that signal along. Um, yeah, so I have messed around with a little bit with modding. I've done a little bit of scripting, some action scripts, some UED, and things like that. Uh, it wouldn't make me an expert by any means, so please don't get the wrong impression. I'm not trying to pass any judgment from someone from a professional level doing this. Uh, this is clearly a very different style of program than most people, I think, are used to that are really involved with this. 
uh, on a serious level. And I'm not saying that you couldn't do some serious work with a visual programming language. I know a lot of people do. Uh, but I think this is sort of something to strike a nice medium balance where it's uh, reasonably understandable to your average player uh, while also not coddling them either. And then I think people who are really involved with this sort of thing on a day-to-day -day basis might find this especially engaging because it appeals to their analytical sense. And that's something I can really get behind. You know, games that could maybe f leave you feeling like you might be a little bit more equipped to handle some other task in life, even if it's sort of incidentally. I think that's a pretty cool concept. So uh, what do we have here? Well, I'm seeing we've got a surface in front of us that maybe we want to modify in some way. So we can take a zero, perhaps? And we can replace this top part of this uh, link to the vector from the 10 to the 0. You can see that was kind of a giveaway since this one wasn't locked down. That we were able to replace it with something else a little bit more functional. So now I should be able to jump up here. And what now? Can I expand this out in another direction perhaps? Is there another way that I can interact with this? What if I put the 10 back? Yeah, all of a sudden now we've got a platform to walk across. Now I left it a little bit messy. Uh, but in this case, there's not really any requirement to be neat. Uh, what can I do with this one? So we've got... So this is what? X, Y, and Z. So let's see if we... Maybe we modify one of these uh, down below here. Oh, we can actually trigger them both at the same time. I didn't actually realize that would link to two things. Thought we had to pick one or the other in that case. Now that doesn't help us. Can we... We can't overwrite this one, can we? No, we can't. Are there any other things we can modify? Well, I guess we could just set it to another zero, right? Make the thing as small as humanly possible. Would that help us? It started out as zero, didn't it? Oh, let's drag this to the trash. Let's just get a better look at the situation before I start messing with it too much more. Oh, what's going on up here? Is that... Oh, that's a solid block. Wow, the color was so similar to the sky that I actually thought that this was like a plane that just terminated right there and that was it. You know, one thing I'm sort of thinking about as I look around is how much I really do like these clusters of primitive shapes and how cool it would be if there was sort of a skybox of activity like this going on where there's these sort of glitching out little textures uh, happening in all different directions with shadow effects and things. I mean, it's a thing that I've sort of seen in a few other games and I think I really always enjoy it whenever I see that. Ah, this is what I didn't see. There's a negative manipulator here or operator that I can then trigger things with. Probably not the zero, though. So let's see if we can maybe trick that by using a 10. And then all of a sudden, well, now we've got a negative. And that's probably not going to be attainable for us to stretch across. So maybe I only want to modify that with one of the two. Probably not that one either. And then what about... What if I just take a number, just a regular old 10, and attach that one of those. There we go. Now we've got a platform we can simply walk across. And that's going to lead us to here, where we've got a very, very deep chasm, and then it just looks like a single platform leading all the way out to there. So how are we going to modify this to get a big old path through? Well, I can actually lead this up if I want. Uh, will that actually work? I was thinking maybe there's a way if I... Ooh, I didn't mean to actually do that. Well, you know, I might as well just stand on it. No uh, falling damage, right? So why not? We'll take a multiplier out. And what's the other one? We've got vectors and numbers. Seem to always want to work with tens here for some reason. And then we'll just attach that here. And there. Oh. Right. Scalar multiply apply force. So that's going to allow me to bounce. Now, can I bounce all the way across this gap? This seems awfully far to me. I'll give it a shot. Oh no, I don't have nearly enough inertia to be able to cross that gap. Alright, so it looks like it actually sets us back at the beginning of the level for that. That's a little bit unfortunate. That means I have to play through this again uh, to conquer this... Well, conquer is not really quite the right word, but I have to open up this path one more time uh, by manipulating and switching these. And then I can switch them back. It actually stored the fact that I left that other operator there too, which is kind of a neat quirk. Uh, so I could actually just grab that, drag it real quick, and then all of a sudden we've got the same scenario going again. I guess if you dealt with particularly long swaths of gameplay, it uh, would probably be a good idea to have some kind of a checkpoint at some point. Oh, I didn't realize we have an up modifier here, so we can actually change the vector 
uh, to something like forward, perhaps, and see what that does for us. Oh god. Uh, what? Did I win? Did it just rocket me through, or did I just get ejected from the level because I'm so... Oh no, I guess I won. That was a little perplexing for a moment there. I didn't quite understand what had happened. All right, so now we're on level three. There's only level uh, one, levels one through three in this entire alpha, so for the moment, not a ton quite yet to see. But there is a sand boat, uh, sandbox mode as well, which I want to leave for you guys to explore a little bit. And there's a wave that seems to be counting up and then down again, and we might be able to modify this. Uh, as you can see, its wave is piping into multiply, and then if I give that a little bit of juice with a number, We'll say we'll add a 5 here. That will cause this to eject from the wall, and then I should actually be able to run along it as that wave uh, moves along its timeline, which will then lead us to here. Uh, so next path, we actually have a big ol' wall in front of us, and I'm pretty sure what we want to do is get on this, and then we should be able to create a situation where uh, the wave is feeding into the multiplier, the multiplier is feeding into the scalar multiply, that's then feeding into the cube, which means if we take an up vector, we should be able to actually modify this to hopefully translate to lifting us up. Look at that. Isn't that handy? Free platform all the way up there. Uh, do I want to man uh, manipulate anything from up here? I don't think I do, actually. I think I'm pretty much safe to jump down. Oh, well, I, I would have been if there was actually a platform there. No biggie. These are still set in motion, so as soon as I get here again basically just keep moving. I love how the shadows actually glitch out too, it's a nice little detail, and means that these, uh, the actual bits of geometry are actually separating, uh, allowing the light to permeate in that case. Okay, so we'll hop down here, and I see there's a goal up ahead of us, so let's see if we can modify this somehow. Um, we've got mass we can add. What can I modify though? What's not locked first of all? We can see this 5 down here is not locked, and what's our other one? We've got numbers, through 10. So if I wanted to, I could do something like this and shrink it down. Probably not super into that concept, and just so you can see real quick what this is going to do. As I attach these from one side to the other, it seems like this is causing these to move, or causing this platform to move in different directions. And I actually have this ad here that I can probably... Can I feed this back into another ad? Just very curious about what I can actually modify. There we go. Oh, wow. I just glitched it all the way across the world. And we've delivered that right in front of us. Let's we'll see if we can maybe cause that to happen intentionally. There we go. And basically just moved us across that gap very nicely and succinctly without all that much effort. So here we go. Is another ability we're going to be able to modify here. Uh, these cubes, or, or rectangles floating through space, are basically just to tutorialize and let us know that I can run on those or walk on the solid space. These, however, are quite transparent, as you can see. Uh, and the reason they're transparent is because over here, we've got a true state feeding into disabled collisions. Uh, collisions are on these platforms, and it's basically just feeding these out indefinitely. So our logic says, what can we modify? This one doesn't have a lock on it, so we can actually change true to become false, so disable collisions, we want to say false to that, because we actually want true, so it's kind of a double negative in that case. And all of a sudden you'll see they start feeding out as solid objects, and now I should be able to jump across them. Now in this case, I think we're presented with a similar state, but we've actually got to kind of rebuild uh, some of the same stuff that was going on. I actually kind of messed this one up when I did it myself. We'll see if we can take another shot at it. So we want enable collisions true. And we've got to feed one into the other into the other here. Uh, so what can we modify? So enable collisions, true collisions, and then collision on platform. Did that do it? They still look transparent to me. I don't think I did it properly. No. All right, I got the order wrong somewhere. Uh, now this is the thing where, you know, being actually involved and invested in... There we go. I had... Main object collision, enable collisions, true. You have to have the proper hierarchy, otherwise the, the syntax is basically going to kick in. Um, if I was a programmer, that would have been a syntax error. I would have been referring to the wrong uh, level of basically a set of folders in one way. 
Alright, so it looks like we have reached the end of Alpha 1.0, and at the time of this recording, I believe there is actually a newer version of this Alpha out right now, so if you actually wanted to go uh, pre-order, I'm pretty sure you actually get a download of this version of it right now, as well as uh, when the game finally comes out, you should get a Steam key, uh, provided they do get greenlit. So there's a lot of incentives. This is a really brilliant idea, something that I'm really glad to have been able to try out. And I really hope that I've inspired some of you guys to go check into it, because I just absolutely love uh, anything that makes you think in new, kind of interesting, unconventional ways like this. And, well, maybe it's not such an unconventional way for a lot of people, uh, but if you're not greatly experienced in this sort of thing, it definitely feels that way at times. So I came out of this feeling a little bit smarter in a way, and I hope that you enjoyed the video as well. Uh, links are going to be in the description for this if you want to go check out Glitch Space for yourself, and I highly recommend that you do. Uh, and please, even if it's just for a favor to me, please consider going over to their Greenlight page and leaving a vote for it, because I'd absolutely love to encourage uh, something like this to get greenlit, and perhaps end up on Steam where it can see a much larger audience. So I will leave you for another day. Thank you everybody for watching. Check out the description for not only links to this game, but as well as my own links if you'd like to find out more about me and the series. Uh, I've got my Twitter, my Facebook, uh, my Indie Impressions site, of course, and my Twitch page. There's plenty of stuff to go investigate, and in fact, if you want to head over to Indie-Impressions.com, there's nearly 700 other episodes to go check out. So plenty and plenty of other stuff to see. Something for pretty much everybody. And I hope you'll come back again and join me tomorrow for another episode. New episodes go up every single day. And in case you were worrying what my character looked like, you can actually sort of see a mirror image of him there. It's kind of interesting. So, I will see you tomorrow. Thank you again, and I hope you have a lovely night.